Yeah, good, good morning. Good, good morning, everyone. So, the guests from online, thank you very much for joining. So, we are starting soon. So wait a minute, please. Good afternoon and morning, every, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a UN Forum on Carbon Neutrality and SDGs, organized by UN University Institute for Advanced Study of Sustainability, UNUIS, and Overseas Environmental Cooperation Center, OECC, Japan. My name is Akio Takemoto, Program Head of UNUIS. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. This forum will engage leading experts from various fields to discuss challenges and solutions for achieving carbon neutrality by 2050 and SDGs. There will also facilitate discussion about the role of education and capacity building in implementation of the Paris Agreement. First, uh, I'd like to invite Professor Shinobu Yume Yamaguchi, Director of UNIS, to provide the opening remarks. Uh, the floor is yours. Recording in progress. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair Chairman, distinguished guests, honorable colleagues, representing the United Nations University Institute for the Advanced Study of the Sustainability, I'd like to extend my warmest welcome to all the participants in this forum. We are gathering here in Glasgow to advance international commitment to address the climate crisis to avoid its most dangerous impact on people and planet the world must realize carbon neutrality by the middle of this century achieving zero emission requires a drastic transformation in our society in pursuing this essential transition we must live up to the 2030 agenda's principle of leave no one behind Considering issues of equity, inclusiveness, fairness is a must. And in addition, we need to maximize synergies in effort to address climate crisis, climate change, and advance our social agendas, minimizing trade-offs. There is an increasing recognition that education plays an essential role in those efforts by mobilizing knowledge and infusing the values and understanding of sustainability in future generations. As the academic arm of the UN system, the United Nations University is uniquely placed to engage the science and academic communities in addressing climate change and other global priorities. With expertise spanning the SDGs across 14 institutes in 12 different countries. In fact, UNU began offering fully-fledged postgraduate degree program in 2010. 
Our institute in Tokyo, United Nations University Institute of the Advanced Study of Sustainability offers master's and doctoral degree focusing on sustainability. And so far, we have produced 92 master's graduate and 60 PhD graduate, coming from more than 25 different countries, of whom nearly half are women. We are proud to, make, to be making such a unique contribution by a UN entity to the sustainable development. Today, I am very pleased to announce that UNIAS will be enhancing our engagement on the Paris Agreement through a unique new initiative. We are developing new postgraduate degree specialization focused on the Paris Agreement, which is planned to be delivered from 2023. We will educate young leaders and experts from across the world, developing vital skills and knowledge to promote key mechanisms of the Paris Agreement to achieve its 1.5 degree Celsius goal. The vision of this new specialization is to further develop the future leaders who will be the forefront of transformative climate action in synergy with the SDGs. We look forward to collaborating with the international partners such as UNFCCC, UNESCO, and GEF to make this new specialization a reality and to deliver it to the next generation of leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, focusing on today's forum, this is a valuable opportunity to engage with leading experts on the key challenges to achieving carbon neutrality and the 2030 agenda and how they can be overcome. First, I'd like to invite our special guest, Mr. Yutaka Shoda, the Vice Minister for the Global Environment Affairs at the Ministry of Environment of Japan, to deliver welcoming remarks. This will be followed by a video message from Professor Kazuhiko Takemoto, the President of the Overseas Environment Cooperation Center, Japan, a co-organizer of this seminar. We will then have two panel sessions to further explore today's theme. I trust that this forum will be an important contribution to the transformative actions and partnership that are urgently needed to realize carbon neutrality and advance other social agendas. Please enjoy the discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for kind intro introduction. I am Shoda Yutaka, the Vice Minister of Global Environment Affairs. On behalf of the on, on behalf of the Ministry of the Environment of Japan, I'd like to extend my hearty welcome to all the participants to the side event at the Japan Pavilion. And I'd like to express my appreciation to you and you IAS and OECC to organize this seminar in COP26, where we have critical discussions to ensure effective implementation of the Paris Agreement. Also, thank you very much for having me. The Ministry of the Environment of Japan has worked together with UNU IAS located in Tokyo to promote policies toward achievement of goals of the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, Japan has declared achievement net zero emissions by 2050 and developed the long-term strategy and the Paris Agreement. Carbon neutrality drives economic and societal transformation and can contribute to sustainable development of societies through utilizing local renewable resources and circulating local economies. For the world as a whole, in order to ensure implementation of the Paris Agreement, capacity building is 
imperative in formulating and implementing effective policies. Broad and high-level expertise specific to mechanisms under the Paris Agreement, including on GHG emissions measurement, national planning for mitigation and adaptation, and the joint credit mechanism is necessary. Concerning such challenges for capacity building, Japan has actively provided technical and financial support to developing countries. Professor Yamaguchi at UNUIAS has announced a plan to develop a new postgraduate degree specialization on the Paris Agreement. The Ministry of the Environment of Japan highly appreciates their initiative, which would generate synergy with our efforts for international cooperation. The role of higher education for youth is critical for all countries to effectively implement the Paris Agreement, simultaneously addressing the social agenda. We will continue to collaborate with UNUIAS to promote policies to address climate change and social change challenges. In conclusion, I hope this seminar will be an opportunity to encourage decarbonization efforts and lead to new partnerships. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Vice Minister. So now I'd like to uh, give uh, you know forward to um, Professor Kazuhiko Takemoto, uh, President of OECC of Japan, and he's providing a video message. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, and participants. On behalf of the Overseas Environmental Cooperation Center, OECC, I would like to welcome you to this session, together with the UNUIAS, which is one of the most advanced institutions in leading policy relevant research and the higher education activities in the world. Actions toward realizing carbon neutrality should be taken by all countries and stakeholders. At the same time, we have to find out wise approaches to avoid a trade of impact by the climate actions in a careful manner. It is also needed to apply an integrated approach to achieve SDGs by mobilizing every effort by all countries and stakeholders. In realizing a decarbonized and resilient society, it is not enough to address a single issue only, but it is very important to take all necessary actions in an integrated manner. In this regard, our organization, OECC, has rich experience and expertise to address not only climate change, but SDGs in developing countries. By making full use of our professional capacity, we have assisted the developing countries in coping with climate change and realizing development, sustainable development. I am very looking forward to dynamic discussions by sharing advanced cases on the frameworks and programs during today's session. Finally, I would like to conclude my remarks by wishing you a fruitful outcome through your active participation. Thank you very much, and once again, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Takemoto. So now I'd like to provide you a framing presentation for today's discussion. Uh, wait a minute.
Sorry, could you say? Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to introduce uh, what uh, UNU is. Uh, UNU uh, is a global system research and training institute. Um, the headquarters on the UNRS is based in Tokyo, Japan, but we have um, 14 research institutes across the world. UNIS is an institute to dedicate uh, to realizing a sustainable future for people and planet through policy-oriented research, education, and capacity-developing activities. And we have four thematic areas, ranging from governance for uh, sustainable development, including climate change and SDGs, biodiversity and society, um, including uh, Satoyama initiatives, and water and resource management, and innovation and education. So session one, um, as mentioned by Professor Emiguchi, we would like to focus on the carbon neutrality and social agenda. Background information is, uh, you know, and carbon neutrality by 2050 requires huge investments in the clean energy and the global scale. That kind of um, action be realized through transformation of economic and social systems. In this case, it's essential for obtaining public acceptance for taking concrete climate actions to realize transformation. So this session will discuss actions for carbon neutrality and associated social agenda. So this is a um, um, key uh, paragraphs from IPCC 1.5 report. So um, carbon neutrality, of course, requires social transformation on global scale. In this context, the social justice and equity are core aspects of the climate resilience development. That will require meeting a set of inter institutional, social, cultural, economic, and technological conditions. Yeah, for example, um, in terms of goal, SDGs goal seven, affordable and clean energy, then there are trade-offs between energy and sustainable development goals. Uh, such as, uh, for example, and well, that has um, synergy uh, with uh, welfare and well-beings, but at the same time, there is a trade-offs. Um, not only this area, but also physical and social infrastructure and environment and natural resources. So our aim is to how we can enhance the synergy um, shown in blue bars at the same time, how we can reduce the uh, trade-offs shown in the red bars. So this is in order, in order for responding to the, these issues, uh, some countries have taken initiative to address that kind of issues. Uh, this is a US national policy for energy justice. Uh, in the United States, uh, their low-income household uh, face a disproportionately uh, to uh, access the energy, uh, clean energy. For example, solar, solar PV adoption by moderate and income households are increased um, since 2010 and representing 48% of adoptions. On the other hand, low-income sectors represent only 15%. So from this, uh, in order to respond, uh, the government of the US um, has taken initiative to deliver 40% of the overall benefits of climate investments to disadvantaged communities. Another example is the European Commission's proposal for social climate fund. This is, was established uh, under the new uh, policy to extend EU emission trading schemes to the building and road transport and export sectors. That, uh, utilizing this fund that will uh, support finance to low, uh, vulnerable households for reducing emissions in road transport and building sectors. So now I'd like to introduce the panelists. So first, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hak Mao, 
who is attending uh, physically, Director of Climate Change Department, Ministry of Environment of Cambodia. The next person is uh, sitting to him is uh, Ms. Kerry Takaya King. She's a council member of Maui County, Ikure, USA. You know, Ikure is the local government for sustainability, is um, the member of more than 2,500 local and regional governments. Um, welcome uh, to today's meeting. And then Professor Yukari Takamura, University of Tokyo, and also the chairman, chairperson of the Central Environmental Council of Japan. She's joining online from Tokyo at 2 p.m. Thank you so much for joining. <laughs> then Mr. Alejandro Kilpatrick, uh, he's a team leader, climate finance and capacity building, UNFCCC. Thank you very much. <laughs> the next, uh, Dr. Wan Jun Byung, Senior Project Officer of Education for Sustainable Development of UNESCO. She is joining through online. Thank you very much. <laughs> the next, Ms. Patricia Marcos Huy Dobro, Senior Climate Change Specialist, Global Environment Facility. She's joining physically. Thank you very much for your busy schedule. Then we, I, we also invite two students of UNIS. Ms. Josephine opoku Boateng, uh, master's course students. Thank you. And uh, the last person is Mr. Marex Orlandis Chuson. Thank you very much. OK, so let's go to the panel discussion. Yeah, first, uh, I have a question to Mr. Mao, Dr. Mao. Uh, question one. Uh, what are, what are the social co-benefits uh, we can expect from the climate mitigation actions from your perspective? Uh, for Mr. Uh, Dr. Mao. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to express my sincere thanks to the United Nations University for Advanced Studies of Sustainability. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my opportunity to share experience uh, and also knowledge in the area of uh, Carbon neutrality and sustainable development, and specifically in the area of the benefit, co benefit of mitigation action. First, I would like to say that uh, Cambodia is the most vulnerable country to the impact of climate change, but we very low uh, greenhouse gas emission contribution. However, as the member of United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, we have an obligation to uh, mitigate the climate change uh, with our own capacities. On this, I would like to say that, you know, uh, peace and stability is very important for our countries in order to develop economies and to join with international communities to address different, uh, uh, clim uh, different crises, including climate crisis. Even our countries, we prioritize adaptations, but of course, mitigation is very important. I would say that uh, recently, we submit our updated NDC. And under our updated analysis, we expect to reduce emission reduction by around 42 percent uh, by 2030 compared to business as usual uh, scenarios. And on this, we propose uh, a number of mitigation actions. And uh, uh, besides the emission reduction, we also conduct an analysis of economic benefit of the mitigation action. As I said, you know, our economy, uh, our countries. We prioritize the economic development. And of course, we need to contribute to the emission reduction, but we need to balance between how if we contribute to emission reduction, whether it impacts to our economic development or not. Because social stability, economic development is very important in our countries. In that sense, the assessments show that, of course, when Cambodia implements climate change mitigation action, we also get some uh, economic benefits Besides that, we also have opportunity to get technology transfers, capacity building, and so on and so forth. And the in-depth uh, uh, and specific uh, uh, quanti quantified, I, I, I haven't uh, raised here, but of course, uh, to some extent, it uh, gets uh, some benefit to our economy. Uh, be Besides that, I would say that uh, in our, under our NDC update, we also try to make uh, the engagement 
between uh, uh, the proposed mitigation action with our sustainable development goals. And on this, we see that it's very correlation between uh, climate change mitigation and also adaptation and also sustainable development goals. Uh, beyond that, I also would like to share to Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, uh, when we look at our updated NDC submit by uh, our uh, member countries, we see that the, 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 the uh, climate uh, uh, the temperature cannot bring uh, to 2 degrees Celsius or 1.5 degrees. It means that it's about that level. In that sense, countries need to take a long-term uh, strategy into account. And since, as I said, since we are the member of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and also Paris Climate Agreement, we also, right now, we're developing a long-term strategy for carbon neutrality. And of course, we expect to submit during this COP. Unfortunately, uh, COVID impact uh, make our uh, preparation a bit delayed. And right now, we're at almost at the final stage. Uh, we prepare some uh, uh, process for at, uh, management approval. And uh, based on this study, it shows that uh, our country, OK, uh, there is a possibility to be carbon neutrality by 2050. And under this, we also conduct uh, co-benefit analysis. Uh, the benefit analysis that we conduct under our long-term strategy for carbon neutrality, we cover both co adaptation code benefit and also uh, economic co benefit And based on the assessment, we found that uh, the implementation of uh, mitigation action to reach carbon, neutral, uh, uh, carbon neutrality in Cambodia can also provide benefit to uh, economic development of the country as well. So in that sense, I would say that uh, mitigation action still provide opportunity for economic development and also to uh, promote uh, health uh, for the people, especially in the context of uh, a COVID pandemic. So I would like to briefly end my uh, intervention here, and I'm very happy to welcome any question or comment there. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Maraso. It's you have noted, well noted on the importance of the economic growth while achieving the carbon uh, reduction. So uh, I would like to have the same question to Ms. King. So Ms. King, you are a politician in the Maui County of Hawaii States of the United States. So I would like to ask your views over this question. Thank you. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, the question is, uh, what are the social co-benefits uh, do you expect from the climate mitigation actions? Well, thank you for that question. Uh, I really appreciate being here. Along with being um, the chair on the Maui County Council of the Climate Action Resilience and Environment Committee, I also serve on the board of directors of ICLE USA, which ties in local governments. We're doing a lot of consulting and direct work with local governments across the country. And I also uh, was just appointed uh, to be on the local government advisory committee of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. So I want to highlight the importance of multi-level interaction. There's a big focus now, especially with President Biden, uh, boots on the ground of the cities and counties and states doing the, will do the actual work of climate change uh, being listened to, finally. We just came from a meeting this morning with our national uh, climate change advisor, Gina McCarthy. And that's what she asked us, how, how can we help you spend the money that we are going to give you? And we have unique uh, challenges in every state, so it's not one size fits all. Some states have governors who won't support the counties because they don't want the money. Some counties, like mine, have councils who, want, who understand what needs to be done, but we're fighting the mayor, putting the money in the right way. So it's gonna be important to have um, objective, data-driven, uh, um, commissions to advise us on where that money would be most effective. But my background with um, the EPA goes way back to 1995 when my husband and I started the first biodiesel uh, company, you know, commercial company in the United States, and we're still at it today. That was back in 1995, and so we're about 26 years old now. But we, we worked with the EPA on setting the standards, ASTM standards for biodiesel, which are still used today, and they've been advancing those. And along the way, we've kept to one philosophy, which I think is really important. We've always said all sustainability is local. So we've kept to that community-based idea that this kind of energy, making, making fuel out of used cooking oil, making fuel out of agriculture, needs to be local to bring the best benefits to the community. 
to, um, for local jobs, for keeping the revenue. Our model in Hawaii, for every dollar that we, of revenue we bring in, 85 cents stays in the state. The petroleum industry has the exact opposite model, where 85 cents of every dollar leaves the state of Hawaii. And, and the job creation for our 1%, right now we're, you know, we're fairly small compared to petroleum. We, we supply a little over 1% of the state's energy and we have about 100 employees. The petroleum industry supplies about 90% of the fuel and they have 350 employees. So can you imagine if we expanded this model across the state, where we're now expanding into marine and we hope to get into aviation fuel piloting. Um, but that, that brings all that to the local economy and that gives us what ICLE is really fo focused on right now, which is the circular economy. We have four pilot projects in the country. Maui is one of them. And we're building models for the circular economy that we can share with the rest of the world and how to, especially coming out of this pandemic, how to diversify your economy. Because like for, for places like Hawaii, where we have put all of our eggs in one basket, everything has been about tourism. And when the pan pandemic shut us down, we had the highest unemployment in the state, in the county of Maui, because we were so reliant. So now we're understanding and we're, we're taking this opportunity to expand our economy, but try to keep it local and circular so it benefits us, it's not so extractive. Tourism is a very extractive industry and we need more local agriculture. We are going to build up the health sector. We're focusing on the film industry and technology um, and, and trying to, the other benefit of that is our young people. We, we think, we, it's often said in Hawaii that young people are leaving the state because they can't find housing. But young people, people in their 20s, don't buy houses. You know, they're not usually looking to buy a house, they're looking to rent. They're leaving our state because there are no career jobs. We're asking them to take $12, $15 an hour jobs in tourism, and that's not a, a lifetime goal. You know, we're asking them to work at McDonald's or a Pizza Hut. That's not a lifetime goal for young people. We need to provide the careers in technology, in fuel production, and renewable fuel production is so exciting for young people. I, I, when you go to our biodiesel refinery on the Big Island, 90% uh, of the, the people processing fuel, the, the men and women, are local. And so you go in there and you see you know, big burly guys with tattoos all over, and, and they're, they're working at the computers and they're troubleshooting they're finding better ways to do things. They love getting up in the morning and coming to work because they know they're doing something important for our community and for the world. So that kind of thing, I think it goes beyond just the economics, it's that social justice and bringing, bringing that kind of um, energy development to rural areas and small communities gives us much more payback than even electric because so far all of our electric uh, charging systems for electric cars have been owned by foreign countries. I mean, Japan was the first one. So, you know, not that we don't love Japan, but that none of that money stays in the state of Hawaii. So that's what I'm, as a council member, that's what I'm looking to do is how do we build models where we, we capture that economy of it and keep it in uh, the country. And by the way, I just wanted to mention that when we built the first biodiesel plant in Maui, the second one was in Nagano, Japan. We got a call from, the, the news went out far and wide, and we got a call from Soichiro Yoshida, who's still a good friend today. And he, he commissioned us to build a biodiesel plant in Nagano, Japan, to run some of the um, Olympic vehicles on it. You know, he was responsible for getting the Winter Olympics to Nagano in 1998. So you folks were on, this country was on the cusp of the cutting edge with us, you know, very early on. And, hoping that that, that, that model can, um, can grow in other areas. So our philosophy has always been to help other communities, other countries, other states with this technology, but not run it ourselves, because we truly believe that this is something that needs to be run for the community, in the community. And I think that's how we're, you know, when we look at island communities, that's the best way for us to get ourselves out of this jam that we're in with the pandemic and with our, our economy, economic situation and climate change at the same time. So I'd like to end by saying beyond, there's only so much used cooking oil you can get in a community. 
And unless you want to really promote donuts and french fries in your diet, which we don't, <laughs> um, you go to agriculture next. So agriculture is one of the best ways you can keep your economy local, right? But it doesn't, it matters so much how you do agriculture, not just what you grow. So the model should be to grow in a regenerative way and we can actually sequester carbon. Our, um, we, we now have a farm, Pacific Biodiesel has a farm which um, is, is uh, carbon neutral already because we're running all of our equipment on 100% bio, biodiesel and we, we plan to get to carbon negative with that model. So it'll be, it's not only part of the uh, local economic um, circular economy, but it will also be a huge part, I think, going forward of climate change that so many more people can be a part of on the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Kings. Yes, so, you know, Japan, uh, we, our institute is based in Japan, so we clearly understand the relation between your state and your county and Japan. And we have also have a similar, very similar geographical situation. So, island country needs to, yeah, um, live up with a sustainable energy system. Uh, while reducing the carbon emissions. So your message, uh, the importance of um, agriculture uh, for promoting carbon neutrality is very, very useful. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, then I'd like to um, give a floor to the panelists from um, Tokyo, uh, Professor Takamura. I'd like to uh, have, uh, ask a question too. What in, uh, interventions do we need to address energy justice? I know that you are professionals on this matter, so floor is yours, Professor Takamura. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Takemoto, and uh, I, I'd like to also join the other speaker by saying that the thank, uh, thank the UNU, IAS, and the whole by OECC uh, to host in this event and to kindly invite me as a speaker. So the, uh, I was impressed by the 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 Miss um, Kim's uh, you know remarks on the, the the what is the core benefit on social community through the climate mitigation action, especially in the field of energy. I uh, totally agree with her and the, the especially the energy transition to clean energy, I think it provides a large co-benefit uh, in the field of, of for, for the society. So the, the, uh, I think the how to maximize the, the such co social co-benefit in the field of energy and in the context of the energy transition to clean energy. Uh, as the um, Ms. Kim mentioned, that the, that is a great opportunity to create a job and uh, uh, to stimulate in the local economy. In addition to the, the enlarging access to the, the modern energy, I mean, which is the, the, the uh, SDGs goal seven. And also, do we know that the uh, clean energy transition is provide us uh, 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 you know, the uh, more or benefit on the health, uh, for instance, the, the preventing premature deaths from air pollution. And also maybe the, for the country and the region, which depend on the import of the fossil fuel, uh, that actually they mitigate the burden of the fossil fuel import bill. So then the question then, the how to maximize this cost benefit and also the uh, mitigate the possible, uh, you know, the adverse impact of such kind of the clean energy transition. I, I, I think the, the uh, you know, the very important uh, point is that the, uh, this, uh, you know, the, the transition to the need zero, uh, need deep transformation of the old, you know, the quote, old part of society. So we definitely need smooth transition uh, by avoiding social instability. 
So uh, through the uh, you know transition to green energy, which involves a large social co-benefit, but still that involve that may cause uh, some uh, problem, especially for uh, those of uh, a part of population or region which uh, who is uh, more vulnerable and is more affected by such transition. For instance, the local population and region depending on the coal production. So uh, I, I think the most important intervention maybe go beyond environmental policy. For instance, uh, we need a support to smooth transition of these uh, local population and the region. Uh, we need to elaborate then the social policy and also the labor policy to support this transition of, of the, those who are mostly affected and vulnerable. And also this uh, you know, transition should, be, uh, should protect and uh, respect the human rights so that maybe we need some institutional institutional mechanism to protect these human uh, human rights for instance some kind of complaint system at the all level or local and the national and maybe international so with these intervention of the national government and local government and even at the international level i i, I think that actually facilitate smooth transition with uh, uh, you know by maximizing the social co-benefit of this green energy transition so that's back to you with dr takemoto thank you so much professor takamura so it's a very important message um the smooth transition taking care of social uh, needs is important for realizing the carbon neutrality in local scale. Thank you very much. So uh, now I'd like to ask the third question. What are the institutional mechanisms that need to be in place to synergize carbon neutrality and SDGs? I acknowledge uh, GEF um, uh, is conducting a various uh, environmental projects to support developing countries um, by synergizing uh, different environmental focal areas as well as social agendas. So I'd like to ask a question to Ms. Patricia, Patricia. And at the same time, and I, I heard that you, you are busy to leave here soon. So if you can have, uh, if it's possible, I would appreciate you could also introduce uh, your uh, capacity building programs to support the implementation of Paris Agreement. That would be um, expected to ask you in the session too. So could you please introduce your um, whole kinds of program? Thank you very much. Thank you and apologies that I have to leave at six because I do have to attend one of the negotiations. We, we are the, um, uh, the financial mechanism of uh, several uh, environment conventions, including the UN SDG TPC, and we have a smaller team this time because of COVID, so we are covering different negotiations. But thank you so much, and congratulations for the, uh, this very timely and much-needed um, new program, Education. I think it's really relevant in the context that we are discussing right now. Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, better? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So now going to the uh, to the first question. So so the GF is um, is one of the uh, most experienced and largest financial mechanisms uh, uh, that helps developing country address uh, global environmental pro problems. Uh, we are working on different areas and specifically on climate change mitigation. Uh, we have been supporting uh, countries uh, over several years. Uh, so now with uh, so many. Uh, net zero carbon goals, uh, sustainable development carbon development goals, uh, NDCs. So we have plenty of, of tools over there to meet our climate mitigation goals. Um, so the uh, DGF uh, is supporting, uh, has been supporting that through several projects, uh, specifically on the climate change mitigation area. But um, over the last few years, we realized, and linking with the previous questions on, on co-benefits that are uh, 
um, everything is, is related, right, and it's interlinked. So we used to have um, a climate change mitigation team, we have a forestry team, but then we realized that the forestry is also quite important for climate change mitigation. Uh, if we are working on forests also, we are improving also the biodiversity of the areas we are working with. Uh, so, so uh, in uh, our previous uh, period, we implemented the impact program. So, where we are working on a more integrated and systematic way, instead of working on an, 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 a specific area. So, for instance, we have the impact program of sustainable cities, where uh, through integrated planning, um, integrated and, and I mean horizontally, but also vertically, from national to municipalities. Uh, we are uh, improving uh, the life of the citizens, but not only through uh, just, uh, just to be in the past, energy efficiency uh, buildings, um, a better built environment, but also we are integrating now electromobility into our projects. So we are going from, um, from silos that we used to work with, we are now working on a more integrated way, so including electromobility uh, that helps. Um, reduce air pollution a lot, this is a, one of our key programs. Uh, as many developing countries, there, this, this is a key issue on, 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 uh, on air uh, quality. Uh, we are also integrating biodiversity in our, in our cities, uh, so we are um, approaching this in a really integrated way. Other, other ways we are um, uh, taking advantage of these synergies is that uh, we, we also um, since the very beginning of, of the jet creation, that was this is our 30th anniversary. We um, uh, design um, a small grant program. So it's a program that provides up to fifty thousand dollars to uh, projects that are driven by a small community. So it is the community is the one who identify their needs. We help them design the program, and then they they implement it. So. So the social co-benefits of those um, projects is extremely high and relevant. Uh, we have supported over 20,000 projects with uh, more than 3,000 uh, 3, uh, million invested in the small uh, grant program. It's been over 30 years and uh, it's getting more and more relevant and uh, we're getting more requests uh, uh, from, uh, from small communities all, all over the world. So this is also a way to integrate uh, the needs of the society with the needs for, the cl for climate change. Um, I think that's all from, for the first question. On the second one, and I'm really happy that you're bringing this because for those who are following the negotiations, we are seeing that uh, capacity building is coming over and over and it's being discussed as we speak right now. Um, and not only because developing countries are requesting it, but also because we at the Jeff, um, we do have uh, in we do have a specific um, uh, let's say pot of money that we use to help countries uh, creating enabling enabling environments. So we call it enabling activities, uh, where we are helping uh, with all the reporting needs and the convention. And uh, we specifically created the, uh, the Capacity Building Initiative for Transparency, uh, CBIT, uh, that has been up and running, I think, over five years. Uh, so we provide support to countries um, uh, to improve their reporting requirements under the, uh, under the convention. So at the end of the day, um, it, um, we try to improve the transparency uh, the, of the data that is being provided in the uh, climate reporting, uh, we try that the data is comparable. So, uh, so, the, so what one country is reporting can be compared to what other country is reporting, uh, and, and this is the the, um, the main objective of this uh, CBIT uh, program that we have. We have supported over, I think, almost 90 countries so far. Um, all the countries who have uh, requested support, we have been supporting them as soon as they meet certain technical criteria. Uh, and I think we've disbursed uh, more than 130 uh, million uh, US dollars in, um, in, in this program. Um, uh, uh, it's, 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 um, and I wanted to highlight that it is important not only because countries are requesting it right now in the negotiations as we speak, but also because we, um, as, the, uh, as the financial mechanism of the convention, we also have the countries and finance the uh, national uh, communications, the, the annual report that they have to submit to the, to the UNFCC. 
And this is where we see delays. We talk to the countries, we talk to the implementing agencies, and uh, in most of the cases, the delays come because there is no capacity within the country, because it's really difficult to find consultants who can, uh, who can really um, uh, get the right data and, and get the reports on time. Uh, so this is something uh, this is really uh, something that countries need, and they're claiming uh, support for that. So I think this uh, new training, guys, that you were uh, putting together is really timely, and I, timely, and I think it's going to be uh, really a success. So good luck with that, and thank you. Thank you so much, Miss Patricia. Yes, um, I, as a as an alumni of the GF, <laughs> so I very keen to the program G, of GF, so focusing on the synergy between the different focal areas as, as well as uh, import, uh, supporting any uh, capacity building activities for the Paris Agreement. This is why I invited you. So, so all the um, you know, session um, um, item is, is relevant to your organization. But anyway, thank you very much for your useful information. I look forward to collaborating with you in the future. So, and thank you Anna, for uh, coming here uh, during your busy schedule so you can leave uh, for another uh, meeting uh, if possible. Thank you very much. So then uh, I'd like to ask Josephine, a student of UNIS, um, on the uh, question. What are the institutional mechanisms that need to be in place to synergize carbon neutrality and SDGs? So since she is uh, studying um, the you know, sustainable development, and such as uh, institutional mechanism of, of SDGs procurement and others at the UNIS, so uh, I hope you can provide your views as, uh, as a student, uh, uh, representing the students of UNIS. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Takimoto. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's really an honor to be here. So um, I agree with what the previous speaker said. I also agree with Professor Takamura very much on her answers to the previous question. I, it was so insightful to listen to all the answers. So for my part as a student, um, on the institutional mechanism that needs to be in place to synergize carbon neutrality and DSGs, I would like to raise just about just three points. The first one I'll focus on is that there should be like more emphasis placed on mitigation actions of specific countries based on their climate um, reports or their NDCs. So in, in case like we take um, climate reports for a specific country based on their NDCs, we'll be able to look at what um, that particular country or that particular the sector so within that country need that needs to be addressed so that it will be like targeted efforts and not as general for all countries. However, we should focus more on targeted mitigation actions for specific countries so that we can be able to address which sector needs what. Because um, the issue of carbon neutrality may be big. However, um, it, it depends most, uh, it, it mostly comes from the energy sectors. Since the energy sector is like the most, uh, the biggest use and then the biggest emitter of G. HDGs that we are facing and all the harmful chemicals like CO2, methane gas, and then the rest. So I believe in mitigation actions, specifically targeted actions of specific sectors within the economy of specific countries as well. Yeah, and then the second um, issue I'll raise is that um, production practices should also be addressed. So as much as we, we look at countries and in their NDCs, we should also focus on their production practices. So um, although energy has transformed from wood to coal to oil and gas, and, and, and now we are looking at renewable energy, some, some sectors still heavily rely on oil and gas and they still rely on coal. So it's, it's, it will be very imperative and very important to if, if we want to move on to a carbon neutral society and link carbon neutrality to all the three aspects of sustainable development, which is the social, economic, and then the the environment aspects, we have to look at production practices. And we, we cannot ignore production practices. It's very paramount. So once we, I, I, in my student opinion, I feel like once we address production practices, that can also, we can clearly see the path in which we want to take. And then I would also like to talk about capacity building. So in this, in this scenario, the capacity building can be in forms of organizational capacity building or making available funds or even 
building of knowledge within those particular sectors so that um, they will know what kind of decisions, what kind of efforts they should take. And then they will have the financial backing to take those efforts as well. So that um, the efforts to link carbon neutrality to SDGs will be very successful. So this is just a, a, a little thing I have to say concerning um, linking the carbon neutrality with all the targets and indicators within the sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Josephine, for joining the, <clears throat> mid, uh, from Tokyo in midnight. <coughs> Sorry. So if you have any difficulty in the voice and the volume, so you can use a um, headset. So please, please ask the secretariat behind. Thank you. So, so let's go to the second one. Um, Session. Yeah, we, I will briefly um, introduce the role of education for the Paris Agreement. So uh, I don't want to repeat um, the uh, information already provided by Professor Miguchi that just today we uh, announced uh, the new postgraduate degree specialization in Paris Agreement. Then, so for information, currently, um, we have two programs, master course and PhD. Then we have 38 students, uh, including uh, Josephine and Marix uh, joining today. And 76% is from developing countries. Then um, due to the you know, latest figure, 50% uh, uh, of the students receives uh, a scholarship provided by you know, public and private organizations. Then, <coughs> Um, you know, um, here today, um, you know, Mr. Alejandro is here, so this is his expertise, but there are a lot of uh, types of capacity uh, that should be enhanced to effectively promote a policy agreement, such as institutional capacity, coordination capacity, and data collection capacity, as well as knowledge on the basic science governance for climate change and linkage linkage uh, carbon neutrality SDGs, all kinds of knowledge and capacity is required. In particular, the, you know, the uh, persons in the developing countries. So, so, so we acknowledge a lot of uh, international communities, including UNFCCC, UNESCO, and JEF, and other UN organization, um, multilateral development banks, and bilateral cooperation has provided capacity building and education. So, UNI has, UNIS, as we mentioned, that we have an advantage of providing postgraduate degree programs. So, uh, in order to enhance our engagement, we uh, decided to Long, uh, in the future to launch the new specialization on focusing on Paris Agreement. S then you can access to the press release um, announced today uh, through the QR code, ah, sorry. You can, sh Secretary, please show the QR code, sorry. Not possible, okay, I'll show you later. It's on the slides. Yeah, okay, so uh, utilizing this time, so I, I'd like to hand over to my colleagues, uh, Dr. John Impact, to moderate the uh, panel discussion in session two. Floor is yours, thank you. Um, just the, the power, the, 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 the PowerPoint, the, okay. I, I mean, I don't need this, but the QR code. QR code, yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Takemoto, for um, the great introduction. Uh, my name is Jung Hee Park. I'm the head of innovation and education program at UNU IS, the same team. And I would like to um, welcome um, our 
panelists for the second segment of this uh, uh, session. And as uh, Dr. Dakemoto just uh, introduced, the second session, uh, second segment of this session is about the, uh, the, the new program, new postdoctoral, uh, no, sorry, new, new postgraduate program on the specialization of the, yes, here, okay. Ah, okay, so the camera is here. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. So this is uh, the magic or the myth of hybrid mode of the um, uh, conference. Okay, so um, again, uh, the second segment of the uh, session is about the a new um, specialization program, a postgraduate program of UNUIS specialized on implementation of Paris Agreement. So now I'd like to welcome our panelists for this segment. And uh, we have uh, two questions actually on the, uh, on the board at the moment. And as uh, Dr. Takemoto said, if you uh, scan those QR code on the screen, you can uh, look at our press release that we just did this morning or at noontime actually in uh, the UK about this uh, new program on uh, implementation of Paris Agreement. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, uh, start with the actually the second question, uh, which is a surprise for the panelists. So the second question uh, is um, uh, to our UN colleagues, uh, Mr. Alejandro, and then also uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Bjorn uh, in UNESCO and uh, online. And the question is the same for our UN colleagues. So uh, UNFCCC and UNESCO are actually leading institutes for uh, both education and climate change and climate actions. And uh, UNUIS is launching this new uh, program on postgraduate uh, on the implementation of Paris Agreement. And I would like to uh, ask how do you see this UN News uh, new program in terms of um, uh, um, leveraging the partnership between your institution and our institution as UNUIS? And also, um, based on your rich experiences in capacity building program, what would be your advice to uh, implement this uh, new program in an effective way? The floor is yours, uh, Mr. Alejandro, first. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Good, good morning to colleagues in Tokyo. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you very much to you and you, IAS, for the invitation. Uh, and it's, it's also an honor to be part of this initiative uh, to collaborate with you and you uh, on this uh, specialized postgraduate degree program in the Paris Agreement, which is very much welcome. I think it's, um, it's very clear that the awareness of what is the Paris Agreement, what it means, has grown quite a lot since the adoption of the agreement itself. And I see it from my own uh, personal experience. Uh, every now and then I, I provide lectures to a university in my country, Mexico, on lectures. And I have seen the difference. I started doing this seven years ago. And the level of awareness, and not only awareness, the level of willing to, willingness to engage from young people to, stu to students, it's amazing. Uh, but there's still so much you can do in a lecture. So having uh, a fully fledged postgraduate program specialization in the Paris Agreement is very welcome because we all in this process we use our jargon, we use uh, terms that for us are self-evident, for, for others not. And I think in a way I always mention a lot of translation. What does it mean? What does the Paris Agreement mean? What is carbon neutrality? What does it mean for for environmental uh, uh, experts, for, for any profession, economists, uh, social scientists, etc. But talking about climate change, the implementation of the Paris Agreement, we're talking about a multidisciplinary approach, something that has to be integrated in all walks of life. We talk a lot about uh, all of government approaches. Uh, what, what, King was mentioning about linking the, 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 the central government to the local level, all the way to communities. That requires some level of understanding and some level of capacity. And 
here we're talking about these um, the three levels that we, we re seldom refer or often refer in the convention, which is in the systemic level, capacity at the systemic level, institutional and individual. And I think with this postgraduate program you're addressing, of course, individual, but at some point the institutional level. Because whatever uh, the, the, the students that, that, that will uh, graduate or, or, or receive their, their degree will form the basis of institutionalizing this, this issue. So that's, that's very much welcome. And I think also an important point is uh, that the, the, the issue of capacity building, the capacity building has always been very prominent in the convention and even more in the agreement with a dedicated article on the capacity building, uh, which is, has a strong emphasis on collaboration, on country ownership, on um, uh, uh, retaining capacities, not only building them, but retaining them, and also uh, the, the, an emphasis on certain groups of countries, particularly SPCs and uh, small island development states. So it's very encouraging to see that the current programs are already supporting these uh, students from these countries. In, in a way, the, the program and now specialization is really contributing to the implementation of the Paris Agreement, Article 11, particularly to the, the very valuable and, and uh, uh, substantial contributions of the Japanese government, which was mentioned by His Excellency the Vice Minister. So that's part of the Paris Agreement. So very, very, uh, very important. In terms of um, what would be our partnership, we, we discuss it and we, we can continue this program as it moves along. We're happy to do that. Particularly uh, on, on those aspects that, that uh, are core to the Paris Agreement and how are they evolving. Because there's still negotiation, uh, negotiation on certain aspects that are the series on another topic. Just to keep the, the specialization of the Casmus as possible, we're happy to contribute to that. And they very, um, also we would very much uh, help as much as possible in information. I think it's important to disseminate for our channels, social media, and other channels. And, um, and also link it, for example, with the work of the Paris Committee of Capacity Building, which is the, the, stand, the institutional arrangement that was agreed by parties under Article 11, and the Paris Committee of Capacity Building has established a network, a network of now 270 organizations, which could be a, an important um, resource to tap into. And in terms of advice, I think is um, what I would say is learning, continuous learning, continuous learning, uh, um, and how you develop the, the program, but how you implement it. And I would also advise mm -hmm. also yes. to promote the creation of networks. Mm -hmm. For example, we have students here, and it's very nice to hear from them. How do how will they connect each other? in their own countries with other students and, uh, and, and among the students countries because I think the concept of peer learning is something that is uh, very important and it's coming up very much in the discussion. Um, so I said this is welcome development and it will be our pleasure to continue engaging with you in UINS uh, to make this a successful specialization program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Alejandro Kilpatrick, for your intervention. And uh, it's actually a really, really important point that you brought up. Um, like, this is really a, a degree program that we can provide to the students and learners. It's not, uh, it's officially certified as a uh, professional for the implementation of Paris Agreement. And also uh, the importance of retraining 
of the of the learners and the officials uh, to implement uh, this Paris Agreement in their context. So it's not just stopping at the uh, one-time kind of education, but then keep retraining them uh, as as a uh, growing professionals. I think that would be a very very good advice for UNUIS to take. Um, now we would like to move to uh, Miss. Uh, Bian from UNESCO from uh, Paris and we would like to hear from her also the same uh, uh, the questions to this to this no, uh, the answers from the uh, to the same question about the uh, the partnership and also advice for the successful implementation of this new program uh, Miss Bian the floor is yours thank you Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Park, and, and thank you uh, to the organizers for this great invitation to this important discussion. And first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, UNUIS for initiating this very special program to cover the diverse aspects of the Paris Agreement, which also contributes to the overall 17 SDGs. And this pro program comes in a very timely manner, as uh, our colleague Alejandro just mentioned, uh, in this crucial year for climate crisis. And as, you, as many of you would already know, uh, one of the UNESCO strategies of climate change is on action for climate empowerment, ACE, which is an important component of the UN uh, Framework Convention on, on Climate Change, as well as the Paris Agreement. And in close partnership with UNFCCC and other UN agencies, UNESCO promotes this individual as well as societal transformation through education, public awareness and training. And I think this particular program that has been or is being launched by UNU is very much in line with this overarching work around AIDS, as well as uh, the new ESD, Education for Sustainable Development Framework called ESD for 2030, which is targeted until the year 2030. So in this regard, uh, I would like to congratulate and also express UNESCO's interest uh, uh, and uh, to collaborate uh, closely with UNUIS on this uh, future work around building capacities of young professionals and experts to ensure that Paris Agreement is, uh, is met uh, in a timely manner. And in this regard, uh, I would like to have uh, suggest a couple of uh, suggestions in, in terms of the implementation of this uh, degree program. For example, uh, the recent uh, synthesis report of the NDC showed that there is a stronger uh, interest and in commitments made by countries across the world on action for climate empowerment, in including the issues around education and capacity building. So this is a very good news. But in, in particular, uh, UNESCO's review of this ACE component of the NDCs and national communications show that uh, the level of interest or types of interest differ from region to countries. Uh, for example, non-annex one countries uh, feel they're, they're more focused on, for example, impact reduction compared to annex one countries. So I totally agree with uh, our colleague from UNUIS, Josephine, uh, on the need for targeted approach, not only on uh, national climate strategies, but also on uh, capacity building and training. So in this regard, I hope that this uh, specialized program by UNUIS can uh, focus and be useful to consider the differences in regional and uh, country context in order to have a targeted solution provided and, and developed throughout this uh, whole program. And I think uh, building on UNUIS's vast networks, including the regional centers of expertise and uh, PROSPERNET, uh, can really help to have this connection uh, with the, uh, the realities on the ground. And secondly, uh, ESD for 2030 framework and the Berlin Declaration on Education for Sustainable Development calls for education to encourage learners to explore values that would provide alternatives to current forms of the, uh, our economies and to ensure that development is done within the planetary boundaries. This, this means that we need to think about strategies to ensure that we bring together societal transformation and reshaping the way that society is designed. And UNESCO strategy also supports countries to green their TBET 
policies, technical vocational education and training policies to support uh, green skills development uh, to ensure that we transition well to green economies and sustainable societies. So ultimately, a massive transformation is needed uh, in our behaviors, our economies, as well as our systems of living. And I hope this uh, new UN UIS program considers this reimagining, redesigning of us, our societies as a broad vision in which uh, all of these programs can be met. So that, for example, the aspects like uh, what Professor Takamura mentioned earlier, social justice, climate justice, issues of um, uh, health and and other social issues can be also integrated in the discussions of climate uh, uh, education and capacity building, which usually is more focused on scientific uh, issues. So with that, uh, I would like to again congratulate and, and, and express our interest to continue our close collaboration on uh, action for climate empowerment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bian, for your intervention. Uh, we were uh, really, really happy to hear your advice uh, on this, uh, both uh, aspects of contextualization and the localization of the issues of the uh, climate action and then uh, carbon neutrality, as well as um, uh, considering the multifaceted nature of this issue in a in a program, and then I think it's it will be really really great advice for us as a designer of the course, implementer of the course. Thank you very much, Dr. Bian, for your intervention again. Uh, I'd like to move on to the first first question again. Uh, no, this is not the. Yeah, is this? No, the the previous one. Yeah, so, no, the first, anyways, so the first question was, um, so we were asking actually uh, two panelists, uh, our actually student from UNU IAS, uh, Mr. Marlex, who is now uh, joining us from Tokyo at I think 3 a.m. there in suit, <laughs> so he's very serious waiting for us. <laughs> so Marlex, I have a question for you. Um, you have already gone through one year of your master's program at UNUIS, right? So now we are launching this new program for the, uh, the implementation of Paris Agreement. What would be your expectation for this new program? Can you share with us? Marlex, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Park. So, uh, well, first of all, um, I wish I could still take it because it's really promising. It looks really promising, especially with a close coordination with the UNFCCC and possibly with the UNESCO as well. But I think it should set itself apart from other degree programs on climate change. And for me, I would prefer a higher degree of involvement and meaningful engagement with practitioners maybe more about experiential learning and dealing with actual cases, actual problems on the ground. For example, closely working with the UNFCCC or with what the UNFCCC or other specific country need and working with their in-house experts. I would even challenge to say that maybe it can veer away from the traditional structure of degree programs with semester specific courses, terms, but function more as similar to an incubator or present some sort of challenge or problem series, which is problem oriented and solution oriented. Some hands-on exercises on existing challenges on the ground. And in this sense, I expect a high degree of focus on building skills, for example, scenario planning, negotiations. How, does, how do you actually carry out a multidisciplinary approach? And the curriculum can focus on identifying and ideating transformative action. It has to be problem-driven and solution-oriented. And again, it should focus on meaningful engagement with practitioners while still observing, of course, academic rigor. So those, those are just my expectations. Thank you very much, Marlex. Um, yeah, what well, you just said really um, um, inspire us as an instructor, actually. Like, we should do more skill-based and uh, 
uh, action-oriented learning rather than more um, knowledge-based or only cognitive ways of learning. So thank you very much, Malex, for giving us this insightful uh, remark. Um, now I would like to ask uh, Professor Takamura, um, uh, because I, I know uh, Professor Takamura, you have been uh, uh, working with us a lot and also um, you've been uh, instrumental for many of the uh, capacity building program and also uh, in terms of the climate actions and all those uh, important areas that uh, COP26 is currently addressing. And I would like to really hear from you uh, what would be your expectations and key advice for this uh, new launch of the program as a UNUIS initiative. Um, because of the time limitation, can I ask you for three minutes, a uh, very brief uh, intervention. Thank you very much, Professor Takamura. Uh, th thank you, thank you, Dr. Park. And uh, uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate UNUIAS to launch this program and focusing on the Paris Agreement. I think, the, as we all know, that the uh, science tells us that we need really maximize of climate action now and to reduce emissions as soon as possible. And also, we need deep transformation toward Nithio. So, uh, I'd like to then highlight the, a couple of points because the, already the other speaker was starting with, uh, you know, the Dr. Wong. Uh, you know, had a, quite a, you know, the uh, useful, insightful suggestion already, so that I have uh, something, I have a very little to add. But the uh, first point that I'd like to say that we uh, may I expect that this program to provide uh, some kind of, you know, capacity building to elaborate and implement and policy and measures in an uh, integral way. So uh, the, the uh, of course the integrating the the, the uh, co social co benefits that we discussed and avoiding the trade off as much as possible. So the of course it's not stop uh, uh, it's it, it's not only for mitigation but also adaptation. That is also I, I think it's a very important. In all cases, I think the better knowledge and understanding on Paris Agreement and the, its implementing rules and the mechanism and governance is essential to uh, elaborate and implement the policy and measure and the NDC and the plans uh, for the country and the region to, uh, to accelerate the climate action. So the second, maybe the second point that I like to highlight, you know, the highlight is that I think someone already mentioned that, that we expect that possible or the future prospective students should be come from the public and private sector as well, because I think they can, uh, you know, get the knowledge back to the, the people and the uh, you know workplace that the the. the uh, which actually uh, need such kind of knowledge, you know, the on the place. And the last point that I that I expect for this program is that the, the uh, you know the, in addition to the uh, collaboration between with the UN organization or other international organizations, I expect that the uh, you know the uh, collaboration was the university and the research institution, which actually have a, you know, the quite a big knowledge, uh, you know, you know, the knowledge base uh, in, in terms of the person and also the uh, research. So that the, uh, I, I belong to the University of Tokyo. I think we uh, already have a collaboration, collaboration with the UNU and the UNU IAS, but uh, we are, very much willing to collaborate or with the continue to collaboration with the UNU and, and, and you know the especially in the with the this in the context of a new program that has launched uh, now. Thank you very much. Back to you, Pat. Dr. Pat. 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Takamura, for your um, uh, intervention. And uh, it was actually a very nice summary of uh, what all the panelists was just mentioning. Um, and we keep a very uh, uh, special notes on the collaboration with the universities in developing and implementing uh, this important program, not just uh, with the UN agencies. So that was really, really uh, uh, great advice for us. Um, now we have uh, just a little bit of time left. I would like to actually invite uh, Dr. Mao and also uh, Ms. King for your short remark on if you have any uh, re uh, uh, feedback or comments that you would like to share on this new initiative of UNUIS, the postgraduate program on implementation of the Paris Agreement. So I would like to start with uh, Ms. King. Uh, one minute uh, remark, please. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I actually um, we started a sustainable sciences management program at our local college on Maui, and I was on the first advisory committee. So what I saw with that program, what I see this program, I agree with Malik that um, having more hands-on um, approach is really important. But I also think there needs to be a focus on specifically what aspect of of um, climate change you want to go into. You know, is it renewable energy? What kind of technology? But then what aspect of it? And I think it's because I, I've spoken to a lot of young students who have, who uh, a decade ago were starting to um, major in environmental studies or environmental science. And when I asked them what they wanted to do, they said, I want to do the environment. <laughs> And I said, what do you want to do for the environment? You know, do you want to do research? Do you want to do technology development? Do you want to be in marketing? Do you want to you know, do supply chain logistics? So those are the specific skills that I think we need to make sure that you come out of this with so that you have a solid job and you're not just approaching um, a, a renewable energy company, for instance, like, like mine, and saying, you know, I'm really excited about climate change. I want to work here, but you don't know exactly what you want to do. So that's the practical side that I see from you know, from being an advisor and also from running in a renewable energy company. Thank you. Uh, really, um, something that we can only hear from the ground, actually, uh, what, what uh, would be the, the, the area that we can work. I want to work for the environment, but what is the area that I can work? So thank you very much for your very uh, uh, ground level, really, really insightful remark. So now, uh, Dr. Mao, if you can have a one minute concluding remark. Yes. Thank you very much once again for giving me the opportunities. I think that right now we move from climate change to climate crisis. So I think it is very important that we need to take into consideration and then we try to find a way how to identify climate justice. I think on this, it is very important to build human capacities. As you may know that uh, uh, each country has to take action in order to respond to the impact of climate change. And climate change is not a one day or two day estimation or not just one year, it is very long years. In that sense, I think science-based approach is very important. And in order to encourage uh, the participation from like developing countries or developing countries, I think the capacity building play a very important role in order to join with the other countries. I mean, at one country where the capacity building is very high. In that sense, I think the approach that uh, Andrew uh, prepared is very important to provide opportunity for other countries in the world to participate, you know. I think uh, climate change, we cannot, it's no border, it, it is a no border matter and we cannot solve alone. In that sense, the participation from other countries through capacity building, I, can, I think can provide another opportunities in order to contribute to reduce the impact of climate change and to provide science-based to the decision makers in order to develop strategies or policies uh, in a, uh, for a long-term approach. And as I said uh, uh, previously, you know, even our uh, countries, we have an opportunity to get the benefit from uh, mitigation. It is because of science show that, you know. But as I said, that uh, the mitigation action that we apply also based on the support, uh, since we, we don't have any obligation to, to, to reduce the emission, but we participate with our capacity. Why we, 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 we understand that? This is based on the scientific show that we can uh, define why our country can achieve this and what we do need in order to implement this kind of activity. So in short, I would say that capacity building is very important and I really appreciate the initiative made by uh, you and you uh, for this kind of opportunity for the students. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Mao, for your uh, very encouraging remark, actually. Uh, the capacity building is really, really important area. Uh, it's a key area, actually, for the countries to implement the Paris Agreement in a successful way. So, um, and also, uh, uh, Dr. Mao just mentioned the multifaceted uh, nature of the uh, climate change again. Like, it's not about the science only. It's, it's important to have science findings, but also we also have to think about the climate justice and the social justice in terms of uh, addressing these climate change issues. So um, it was a uh, very uh, encouraging remark. Thank you very much. Now uh, I would like to hand uh, the microphone over again to the MC today, uh, Mr. Dr. Dakemoto. Yes, thank you very much, Joey. So now We'd like to close this session. Thank you very much for joining. So I'd like to ask um, Professor Maguchi for closing remarks. Please, yes. Okay, um, good evening. Hello, everyone, again. Actually, I had a um, um, very short, uh, beautifully written um, closing remarks, but I am changing my mind because I have, um, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your great contribution to the panelists in person here and everybody online. I have a very um, happy and positive uh, sense uh, at the end of this session. And I know I have one minute, but I'd like to share why um, I am um, augmenting my happy feeling with the three reasons. First of all, it was a brilliant experiences uh, from uh, listening from such an expert from the diverse and background, including local government, national government, and international organization, university, and the student with very specific answers, They're your, your own answers and very specific, specific experiences. So it was a, quite a learning experience for me. So I really thank your time and thank you for your valuable, valuable experiences. <laughs> Second of all, I have felt the very positive direction of our future in Dubois, because in the last three days, we have heard so much challenges for the carbon neutrality society and the climate change, the mitigation effort. But today, we had a brilliant question um, to discuss the core benefit Okay, and the uh, integration of the international, important international processes with the local actions. So I really appreciate a representative of uh, UNFCCC and UNESCO um, communicating with the local university, national government, and the local the government. I really have a very, very positive uh, future looking um, perspectives with me now, and thank you so much for your all, um, everybody's contribution. And third of all, um, I really felt this was the intergenerational dialogue, and this is something that we really want to promote in the future. We have been promoting this intergenerational um, discussion and dialogue, but this was really a very concentrated 90 minutes discussion, um, um, integrating everybody's opinion from the different generations. Uh, it was such a learning experience for our student, but it was really a learning experience for me as well. So I have really increased my motivation. Of course, I was motivated to begin with to do more, to make um, the things better and to conclude I think uh, our panel uh, session really um, um, made clear that for uh, realizing the carbon neutrality society and the great uh, social transformation, it really has to be inclusive and transparent and just. So thank you very much, everyone, for your contribution from Paris, from Tokyo, and from here, the Glasgow. I look very much forward to our further collaboration to make our world, um, planet, 
and life better. Thank you very much. So uh, may I ask uh, the panelists to stay there and also the, um, the virtual panelists to stay there to have a hybrid the photo together. Thank you. <laughs>